Hello, everybody. My name is Graham Elwood, and you are watching The Political Vigilante. Uh, happy to welcome back to the show the director of Revolution Televised and uh, other documentary films, uh, Kevin Ronka. Kevin, how are you today? Hey, I'm doing great. Nice to see everybody. Um, so we wanted to talk to you because you were literally in Guangzhou, China, which was the second most affected place uh, next to uh, Wuhan, I believe, in terms of and you were there, like in the middle of this crazy outbreak, and I wanted to talk to you about what you saw versus what the American media was telling us was happening. Sure, sure. Um, and yeah, and just to give a little background, uh, once a year I go visit my wife's uh, family in China. So it's something we look forward to all year. So it was just the craziest coincidence that this most recent trip just fell right, right at that sort of time period. So. Um, when I went out there, it was interesting because, you know, I brought a camera just to sort of shoot the vacation, just to kind of capture, you know, like my family and, and, you know, my mm -hmm. wife kind of having a reunion with her family. And it was a very, uh, it was very slow initially. It was like, um, because there's a misconception of people who haven't really been to parts of Asia or Southeast Asia or anywhere over there that, you know, these people live in, in sort of an authoritarian country and, and don't know anything about what's going on and that we almost know more than they do. But it's just, it's preposterous. Like they're, they're well aware of the, the government they live under. They just don't you know openly say it outside. So I was getting some of that before even the Chinese media was, was coming out about it. You know, like, um, the, like the people I was staying with, we're telling me, you know, that people have been getting sick and they're not exactly sure what it is. But because of SARS, there's, you know, some fears and things like that. So uh, but what I was really surprised by was just and I'm going to get to your question was just how quick everything kind of happened, because um, when you live in a democracy, which is a wonderful thing, uh, you have so many opinions to weigh in on something when something happens, which is what we're seeing now. And there it was like. Overnight, uh, I went to the mall and I was being scanned at the door. Every business. Overnight, uh, you know, rules were in place that you couldn't go to people's houses unless they were blood relatives. Masks had to be worn outside no matter. I mean, it was like the next day. I mean, it was just kind of crazy to see action like that. So I like to be weighted. There's, you know, there's very little I can get, you know, say about what we consider like authoritarian governments. But I think people fail to, to look at, you know, this is just a very completely different ecosystem. Mm -hmm. When you go to a new country, you can't apply American sort of uh, rules, you know. And, and the other thing is they never apply, like, uh, when, when they go, when, when people think of other countries, they'll say, oh, well, they're authoritarian. We have, we have all this freedom. But they never apply, like, all the negative parts of America that these countries, you know, don't possess, you know. like And with that, like, socialized medicine, uh, one thing we did hear a lot about was, like, everybody could go to the hospital, right? So as soon as, like, word got out, like, once that announcement was made, Everybody went. Even people who didn't have it. Everybody just went because they didn't have to pay. So masks and everything ran out quickly. And sure, like lines were long, but uh, it, it, I knew right away it was going to be a much bigger problem back here, where people are afraid of copays and deductibles and all these things that deter them. So Americans, and they were even saying this to me, um, Chinese people I was meeting there. Oh, oh it's going to be worse if it gets to America because. No one's going to want to not go to work. No one's going to tell people they have it. People are going to be afraid to go get it checked out. So you don't get this like instantaneous preventative sort of bubble that went on. So like, uh, and, and you know what? I, I told this on Ron's show, but it's interesting. So I do want to tell it if it's okay because sure. it, it, it was it was kind of eerie when I first got there. Um, so you know, it's the the Chinese zodiacs and how they they work is you know you have your uh, you know, each year is a different zodiac. And then on New Year's, they celebrate that. There's the pig and the cow and, you know, the different constellations. Uh, so this year was the rat or the mouse. And when I got to China, there was already worry beyond people getting sick by her relatives because, and, you know, uh, Westerners will call it superstition and people in China will call it, uh, you know, more spiritual beliefs. But um, so in China, just bear with me, in China, they have five seasons, Right. They have um, winter uh, and then I guess. Yeah. And then, you know, you have winter, uh, autumn or spring and then summer and then late summer. Right. So you have five seasons instead of four late summer being the fifth season. So here's the thing. When I got there, the relatives already didn't want to go on vacation before they even heard really much about the illness, because they believe that. And, 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 and a lot of people believe that. So you have the 12 
So the, for all the zodiacs to go, you need you, it's twelve years, right? Twelve of the different zodiacs, um, and that would be a season as well. So because you know the, the culture is very mathematical, so twelve years of the zodiacs a cycle, and five of those cycles would be going through all the seasons. That'd be sixty years, right? But their five seasons also line up with the five elements. So that would be um, wood, fire earth metal and water which is like the build and destroy life cycle mm -hmm. right so the season of the cycle when you go through them all so 60 years was their belief of there would be a, dis a destroy period in china china would get better and better and then a big event would happen and me and my wife i swear we kind of laughed it off but the irony of it was you know so in 1840 you had the opium war which decimated china with addiction because the british merchants were bringing it in it was mm -hmm. basically like biological warfare and then 60 years later was the 1900 was 1900, and you had some invasions in parts of Europe, and and China was in a terrible place and gave up some territory. And then 1960 was Mao's big massacre, and then I get out there for vacation, and it's 2020, <laughs> and so it was like hearing that I was like, yeah, okay. And then two days later, that announcement coming out that this could be bigger than SARS, and that you know uh, that was really crazy, and everybody immediately thought, oh, this is it, this is that big event, it's going to cripple China, and. So, like, certain of her relatives didn't even want to go outside. Um, so that was that was alarming and, and strange. So. Well, the thing that's interesting is, like, you know, I was talking literally to a doctor today who said, I don't know that we can trust the numbers out of China because they just sort of, their numbers sort of did this because we he, he, was, he was saying basically we couldn't trust the Chinese government. The reporting in South Korea and Japan and Europe, is, is he felt, was a little more accurate. How did you feel in terms of what you saw, what was being reported, and what the reality was? Yeah, yeah, and I want to, yeah, and, and I'll talk about that now. I wanted to give a little context to my trip, because uh, I wasn't just like, you know, just running over to China just to sightsee, but I will say this. I, I was amazed by the reaction I was getting. I was watching CNN. We were all as a family watching CNN because we have a VPN. And we were we were kind of going back and forth between that and the Chinese media. I want to talk and, about that real quick because you brought it up VPN. So, so everybody says, oh, that you can't go to these websites in China. And I've been there numerous times. I'm like, yeah, but everyone's got a VPN and they go to Facebook and Yahoo and all this stuff that's banned. I mean, like they, they're, they're all on the internet, you know, and they've got WeChat, which is the biggest thing I've ever seen in my life. WeChat's uh, pretty wild, yeah. So oh, no, no. I mean, that's the thing. The misconception is like people in China can get movies like before we do sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, like literal like Blu-ray copies. Not implicating anyone I'm, I know, but you, you see it all the time. If you know people from China, like they're very savvy and like the idea that they're like people think in America. I meet people even from my hometown that think it's like North Korea, and, it, and it's like no, you know, and, and even people in North Korea they think that they're not even aware. But there's a difference between not being aware sometimes and not being able to really question that, you know, like legally can't really say anything, but it doesn't mean you don't think it, right? Yeah. But no, in China, I did initially feel like they were kind of downplaying it, but then I, it was weird because on the other end of it, I saw America sort of playing it up because. What I thought from what I saw in America was they looked like they were seizing on the opportunity of a major rival world power in peril. I mean, right. that is what I believe I saw. It was like being used as a bartering chip, like, let's cut China off. This is what we need right now. And I saw that because I, I felt like I was seeing a lot of mass hysteria. Yes, the numbers were high, but I'm seeing more outcry for this thing happening in China than – and it wasn't sympathy either. It was more like, oh, my God, look at how kind of crazy this is. Oh, they're they're in trouble. and. You know, at the same time, that was true. But look, at we had talked about this, you know, half a million people sleeping on the street. Right. At that time in China, when the hysteria was starting in the U.S., it was like 2000 cases, 3000. Now, that was rising rapidly. But let's look at how the wealth gap rised rapidly in, in this country. Let's look at, you know, how many uh, Iraqis were killed for oil. I mean, it's just like the numbers at that time did not seem astonishing. And uh, but but I will say this, you know, I think that for me. Uh, and the U.S. was kind of, I think they should have had a more sympathetic approach to this, especially as it now came to us, but their economy. I think that China was, was initially kind of soft playing how bad it would be for the economy. But as I stayed there, I could see like it, it became really, really sad. Um, people I knew who had small businesses that couldn't work for a month and had to pay their employees because the Chinese labor laws have changed a lot. China still gets hit with a lot of the stereotypes of people working for like a buck an hour, but it's not really true. Um, and, uh, you know, that's a whole nother discussion. But that was the thing that was the scariest was not people getting sick, which was terrible. But you have to think China's a country of one point three billion. 
And I think the U.S. underrated how well they actually did handle it. Sure, the misinformation was there because they have a state-run uh, news cycle, but America's news cycle is run by corporations. So I'm not sure if we're like the ones to be. Yeah. And that's a lot of what I got. I had a lot of Americans like while I was there. Like initially, it was like, "Are you okay? I'm watching in the U.S. and this looks so nuts," um, which I thought was r ridiculous. But then it became like it almost felt like the. Uh, the American corporate uh, mainstream media perspective that they know everything and they know what's best for you, very consumer pitch type of, uh, you know, type of propaganda. I felt like that was being parroted to me through people I knew. And that was really sad. It's like, you know, like they're telling me like what I should be worried about and what's really going on because nobody in China knows anything. And that was like a really like um, kind of come to God moment where I was like, wow, and the Westerners really do have this sort of condescending xenophobic perspective. It's not really concern. Um, it's more, yeah, I mean, that was depressing, to be honest. Well, I mean, that's the thing, like having been to China several times, I heard people say, oh, it's authoritarian. And I, don't know. And I heard the same thing, you know, when I went there just to do stand-up shows, I heard the same thing when I went to Russia. Everyone has this skewed view because Russia and China are big, the big, uh, you know, uh, competitors in terms of being superpowers. And so, you know, the things we accuse China of, and it's not to say that, not that we're wrong, but we refuse to then acknowledge our own stuff. It's like they're putting terrorists in camps and Muslims in camps. Uh, I don't, Guantanamo Bay? I mean, what are we doing? We have black sites where we just torture anybody that we just say, oh, you're a terrorist. We can just, you got no rights. We can torture you. We can do whatever. We've set the middle. I mean, how many drone strikes, you know, how many civilians have died from Chinese drone strikes? I mean, no, absolutely. And Max Blumenthal, too, because I was concerned about the Muslim camps. He did a I, I'm pretty sure the gray zone covered that and said, like, even that, like America's been grasping a little at straws with that, too, ironically enough, because there's just not enough. I think like eight people were interviewed that have said it. But I mean, I'm not saying it's not happening, but like it's like that that kind of thing. Like, you're totally right. Guantanamo comes to mind. Um, and the other thing, too, that the U.S. never mentions to ch about China is nobody's really donated more money to Africa than China has. And nobody probably ever will. And uh, their foreign policy, I mean, if you go back to like Pol Pot and like the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia during, you know, like Vietnam, they were definitely, you know, which was like the Cambodian Hitler. China was was supporting that as as was the U.S. though. Ne yeah. Neither one really. But, but generally, China was much more in line thinking with like the anti-imperialist movements and some of those more revolutionary groups. So like, I think China, you know, it's like, you're always hearing it from America's perspective, who is like the imperialist post-colonial bully of the world. I mean, I hate to say it, but they are. I yeah. mean, and I, I don't, I want to go back to Corona, but I just want to say, because I mean, you know, um, I was amazed, uh, not just about this cycle, how we talked about Castro so much during the election, but this moves into China with, it's so much discussion about Castro, like denounce Castro. How could you say anything? What about Batista? You know, what about the U.S. backed tyrant that Castro helped launch the revolution against? And with the Sandinistas, too, it's like denounce the Sandinistas, but don't denounce. I mean, if you're not for the Sandinistas, then you're for Somoza. You're for the Contras. Right. I mean, these were death squads and ruthless murderers. So, like, it's always fascinating to me. And it, it, it links with China. Of, like, we're quick to call people authoritarians. But, like, what what is Henry Kissinger? You know, what, what do you call a man like that? I mean, I'm sorry, man. Listening to Biden try to, like, Bernie's supporting authoritarians. It's like, oh, my God. It's unbelievable to listen to Joe Biden. And American, the neoliberal left, just actively seeks to put their head up their ass and forget the eight years of the Obama administration. It's un oh, yeah. And they want to vote for Biden. They think Biden is more is different than Trump. It's unbelievable, and it, it, it just it's it's like we've backed. I mean, I could give you. We could both sit here and list off a, a yeah. two dozen dictators that the United States has completely backed. Okay. I mean, and then there's the thing. The thing too, and this is what where it goes back to China is. I mean, just look around China, um, Timor, uh, East Timor, the island uh, in Southeast Asia, Burma. I mean, there's all these Cambodia as well. There's all these blips on the map around China that, that the United States is like outright destroyed. Like you hear about Latin America, we hear about the Middle East. So like I think China and the U.S.'s relationship going into the current, it was already so interesting to begin with because they clearly see each other as rivals. Um, and they clearly both say things about the other. But Corona was to me like a really astonishing moment seeing how like the demonized country handled it because what I saw there was like 
some of the most organized preventative, you know, and I think because of SARS and because they have 1.3 billion and it's even harder to keep track of people there, there was just a media. And the thing thing was for being a country that falls under like authoritarian, which I would say is more like, you know, like a communist. I mean, yeah, it, it does have its human rights issues, but nobody was upset that people were scanning people at doors. Like they were all kind of with the president on that from the youth to the older. Um, most of the, I talked to people from a wide uh, range and nobody felt like it was uh, tyrannical or like, you know, it was devastating. Where in the U.S., I actually would be really concerned about um, the kind of surveillance like Israel and some of these other countries are going to move through under the guise of this, just like they do with terrorism and other aspects of war. Like, yes, I do want to be keeping an eye on who has corona, but what I'd hate is this is not another excuse to sort of like surveillance the, the citizens, especially as there's a larger and larger working class movement uh, that they would just love to sort of keep tabs on, you know, and I think you know, that, that's something that's kind of worries me. Well, yeah, they're going to, I mean, it's a legitimate pandemic. It's a real one. And it's not either or. And they're going to use it in some cases as, a, as, you know, to manipulate the system for their gain and keep people home who want to vote or keep people out of the streets. Yeah. And so there's no protests, you know, like there's no protesting going on right now anywhere in the world because everyone's got to be on lockdown, you know. Um, no. But I want to get back to when you were there and you saw this very coordinated clamping down um, in China. What was the reaction of the Chinese people? Were people hoarding food and toilet paper and stuff like that in China? Yeah, yes. And I'm so glad I had my camcorder because we're going to be putting this documentary together and probably just, we're probably just going to put it online for free because it looks like festivals are out. But what I saw was, and that's the beautiful thing, is humanity beyond culture and religious belief. And you'll see this when you go to other countries. Human beings really are human beings. When you take away and strip away the filters of media and the shifting of per perspective and you just go to these countries. I was seeing a lot of what I saw here. I mean, granted, I saw a guy in a gas mask picking fish in a grocery store. I mean, talking like a full blown, uh, you know, but generally it was a lot. It was the same, like the family running to Walmart and stocking up and they actually had limitations on what you could grab. I'm not sure if that was happening here as well, but you, you couldn't just walk out of the store with all the water. You know, there was there was a but no, actually, I got yelled at for filming in the grocery store, but I did. I saw. I feel like uh, it's like somebody gave me a preview of what I was going to see here, more or less, but without the American hysteria. Um, Westerners have a, uh, and I am a Westerner, I'm speaking from experience of going to some other countries, Westerners do have a very me first. It's all about the individual, and that's not a bad thing, because that also means freedom, but in China, whether you're at a dinner table or even in the country, and maybe this is why some of them are more willing to go along with this kind of a leadership is there is a belief in, in everyone as being connected. When you have 1.3 billion people, it's all becomes a, they feel it is like almost one body in some ways. I mean, they want individuality, but people are thinking for others. I don't see anyone like throwing anybody or some of the craziness that, you know, you know, you even see it like a um, Black Friday in these types of states, you know what I mean? So there was there was something like that. And then people were still going out. There wasn't as much. Uh, I did, definitely didn't feel like the fear was as much of a big thing. I don't know if that again, I don't know if that's because they've been through SARS and uh, everybody was just kind of new to, to sort of fall back a little bit. But, um, you know, they seem, everybody to have was a, wearing a mask. they seem to have a better grasp of, of the concept of death. The one thing I've noticed from traveling the world and studying different religions and beliefs and cultures is that Americans really th think they're going to live forever or something. They think whatever it is, they're gone or they're essential oils or they're whatever is going to make them live forever. And Americans really don't want to accept death. They really have a hard time accepting it. Not to say, oh, we should all just roll over and let this pandemic kill everybody. But like in other cultures, they're like, well, yeah, it's, it's you know, it's, uh, it, it, you know, my, she was 95. So it was, it was time, you know, it was time to go. And Americans like, oh, you know, like, even just at a funeral and people are like, oh, I'm so, it's so sad. And it's just like, no, it's sad when a 15 year old dies. That's sad. A 20 year old, a 30, that's sad. An 85 year old, a 90 year old, well, they had a good run. I miss them. I can be sad, but like Americans, um, and yeah, all humans, you know, have a survival instinct, but Americans seem to have kind of a crazy concept about, they don't, because we've put so much stress on the individual here, and like you say, some good things have come from that, but the, the American is like me, me, individual, um, where in many, not just, I mean, uh, not just uh, China, with the, that's a communist country, but like Japan, South Korea, you saw the Asian, the Asian culture seems to be way more like family, to work together, everyone's a little more compliant or whatever. And 
in, in a situation like this, the American, you know, I'm just going to go it alone is like, no, we, we can't just go it alone in this thing. We all need to work together. We need to help out our older neighbors and somebody who can't go to the store because they're like, I was just at the store today and there was like two, only two things of, of almond milk, milk left. And the, I said, is that it? He goes, that's it. And I said, I'm going to just take one because leave, leave the other one for somebody else. And he goes, yeah, man, people have been acting, the, the store goes like, well, everyone's acting nuts. I go, I, you know, I, I got, I'm good. I got others, you know. Like, and I'm, yeah, I wish there were more people like you, Graham. I mean, you hear stories of like eight people in New Hampshire dying in a hospice above 80 from Corona and someone going out and buying a handgun because of that, you know, like, it's like the absurdity of it, but no, I'm really glad. I didn't mean to cut you off, but I'm really glad you brought up, uh, the way death is treated in both. Cause I think that is a, is a huge thing to think about. Um, you know, it, even in China, I mean, I'm not saying people are emotionless, but they maybe channel their emotions at times a little bit better. I mean, when I go visit Pennsylvania, and I can't generalize for all people, but I see it a lot in China. If I go visit my, my family, I haven't seen them in a year, they're going to be giving me the biggest hug, an Italian family, very close. You know, I'm going to be getting a million goodbyes, and it's a very warm thing. And in China, it, it's not that it's not warm, but when my wife sees her family once a year and they get to the airport, it's like, all right, bye-bye. <laughs> just like get on the plane. I mean, it's like, I'll see you when I see you. And I'm like, when I'm leaving, I'm like hugging everybody. And they're like, especially during Corona, they're like, all right, like, we're good. We'll see you next year. Don't, don't. I think there's just a wide perspective, and I think it is less than the, the importance of the individual. The importance of the individual does fall a little bit under the wayside. And I think maybe one of the reasons you come off that way, I mean, is because, I mean, you're a good person, you're a generous person, but also you've been to other countries and you've seen that, you know, there is a lot of worldview beyond just like America. And that that's what I saw at the corona when it happened in China. It was still like an America first perspective of like, better not come here, you know, like, like it wasn't like, oh man, those people... Um, and I think progressives more so do kind of see that because um, we have a much more weighted perspective usually on things like foreign policy and, and a much more weighted perspective on. You know. Well, even Trump's reaction to closing down the, the borders to the EU, uh, flights from the EU. OK, that's fine. He didn't consult with the EU leaders. He just did it. And it caused a, sh a shitstorm over there because he's just like America shutting the doors like. Tell them, you call them up and say, this is what I need to do. I wanted to give you notice. We're doing this starting tomorrow morning so you can prepare. Your airports are going to be overrun. He just, that just America, woo, keep them out. But let Americans with COVID-19 in. You know, it's just like um, his reaction last week, numerous times seemed pretty stupid to me. Uh, the last day or two, it seems like he's finally got a team of people around him that are actually doctors and scientists and not just Mike Pence's and I don't know what he's going to pray COVID-19 out of everybody or whatever his plan is. But like today, I actually heard two different, three different doctors speak. And I was like, oh, there's adults in the room. Okay, good. And then Trump comes back and we're number one. We're going to beat the virus and all of the great glory of the virus in the U.S. And I'm like, shut up, sit down, let one of these uh, doctors speak. Um, and when I they like your Trump impression. I like your Trump. I'll tell you, he was calling it the China virus. Literally, he's calling it the China. I mean, it's like. There's there's a lot of belief that, you know, I remember when I went to China, a lot of people were sick here. I mean, everybody had the flu. It seemed like I was working in an office doing temp work just to help my wife's company and like half the people there were sick. And they are thinking now, I don't know if this was confirmed or not yet, that a lot of them had influenza, but they thought maybe some of them had corona, which would mean that it's been around a lot longer than we even realized. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, with Trump, it's like, uh, you know, I don't expect him to rise to the occasion, but when you put in charge someone like Mike Pence, who Multi, you know, helped contribute to the AIDS outbreak uh, because he wouldn't get clean needles. I mean, he is the worst person. But I agree, the tone the last couple of days changed, and I don't want to be too pessimistic, but I wasn't excited to see someone like Lindsey Graham saying, like, he's going to shoot down any kind of, like, UBI. That was really disappointing. I mean, even, like, Mitt Romney is talking about being on board with something like that. I mean, Mitt Romney, of all people. Well, the, the, good, the good news is, is, like, people, the, the, the Americans are seeing their MAGA hat is not gonna protect them from this virus. And the, the people are seeing the vote any blue will do's or the MAGA hat people, all that, that multitude of people are seeing, oh, the government does not care about you. You better wake up because they last week gave $1.5 trillion to the banks. They've just infused more thing to try to stop. The, the, the stock market nosedived again yesterday. It's picked back up a little bit today, apparently, but they gave $1.5 trillion to the banks and $50 billion in stimulus. And the whole country's going, wait a minute. You're telling me I can't work. 
everyone's being affected financially. I don't want a low interest loan or a tax break. You need to send me a fucking check because how am everyone's going, how am I gonna pay my bills? And everyone started screaming that. So these morons like Pelosi and Mitch McConnell who are, are fucking idiots. They're stupid, rich morons that are the, uh, the, antip the, the antithesis of the, of the, the uh, uh, or the pinnacle rather of this corrupt system. America's seeing, oh, capitalism makes a pandemic like this worse. So, when Biden said, hey, we need to give everybody money and we need to give everybody free Medicare, it's like, oh, socialism? Socialism and Medicare for all? And Americans, like I think, are starting to work. platform, right? Yeah. Bernie's platform. I mean, it, you know, the funny thing is that when you see Mitt Romney offering to give more money than Kamala Harris, I mean, that was kind of surprising. Like, has the Democratic Party shifted so far to the center right that a guy like Mitt Romney could be proposing a, a socialist program that tops theirs? I mean, it, well, this yeah, is surprising. because Mitt Romney is a is a Mitt Romney is a Reagan Republican. You know, he's a Ra he's the Republican. What the Republican Party looked like in the '80s, and mm -hmm. most of these Democrats, these mo these moderate, they look like Reagan Republicans. So, so they're all. The Republican Party has gone so far to the right, they're just fascist. The Democratic Party has followed them, so now they're like the Republican Party of the 80s. So that's what makes like people think, oh, Liz Warren is a progressive. No, Liz Warren has always been a Republican, just everything shifted. Yeah, yeah, everything moved around her, so she kind of she ends up landing on the spectrum. I mean, yeah, you know, and, and in regards to that, this is a really interesting time, because I think from seeing, being in a, in a communist country, being in a capitalist country and seeing the sort of inverse of how they're handling these things. And like, there's so many great things about democracy, but we never know what the hell's going on because there's so many partisan things. And, you know, it, again, I, I think, um, I'm a little, I was a little worried there while this was unfolding, even though I was trying to get a flight back as soon as I possibly could, because all the flights were getting canceled. Of like, this is probably going to make it to America. And we had talked about that a little bit. And like, that's where I was getting really afraid. I, I really was. I was like, we have we are literally so vulnerable. We play up as like the greatest country in the world, oh. superpower, but we are so weak on something like the the uh, the corona, where like we don't we don't have any good medic. We have no healthcare system in place. We have no you know we're such a capitalist society run by corporations. We have no way to fix uh, the poverty problem if this happens. We have no kind of socialized program to take care of people. Uh, people are worried they're going to lose their jobs and be totally done. People have family members with cancer and, and can do nothing. I mean, we're just like the worst country to have this happen because uh, everybody gets sick. Nobody can really skip work. So, And you have people even still going out to socialize. That would not be happening in China. If you were out and about just going to a party or a bar, they would probably they probably come, come and get you and tell you you got to go. I mean, I got yelled at for not wearing a mask. And one day, I was out with a mask for like an hour filming, and I got nervous. And I got approached. So, I mean, and I actually almost got stuck in China. Um I don't have Corona, but I had packed up all my stuff. We had to grab our flight got canceled. And we were told if you don't get on this flight on the 12th, we we're supposed to leave on like the 19th that uh, you can't get back. Basically, and we're going to be stuck in China. So obviously that wasn't going to work. And so we, we booked this flight. It was like two thousand dollars a seat. I mean, it was, it was, it was pretty expensive. Um, and the flight was nerve wracking. Everybody on there with masks. Every time somebody coughed, every, you know, but. When I got to the airport, it was in kind of a rush. I had all my stuff. I had my coat on. I had my beanie. It was a rather hot day, but I just had everything on me. It was just kind of running through the door. The doors were actually heat, heat sensitive. They could actually read your temperature when you walk through them. So uh, I actually set off an alarm because I was sweating. Uh, it was like a silent alarm. And I walked in. They took me out of line, and they scanned me. And I was getting scanned on my forehead all day, every day, going in apartments, going to the mall. And uh, when they scanned me this time, you know, usually it would – Deep kind of it would be green when your temperature is below this, this certain degree. And for the first time ever, I'm sweating and it beeps red, and it's like a beep, beep, beep. And they're like, you, you can't, you can't get on the flight. You got to leave the airport. And I was like, my jaw dropped. You know, I was like, oh my god, like I'm stuck in China. And my wife luckily uh, got out of line and, and talked to the, the woman and said, look, um, he, he's just sweaty and he's stupid. He's wearing his wool coat and his hat in the in the, in the winter in the summertime and like he or or not the summertime, but it was it was hot out that day. Mm -hmm. She said, you know, he's just he's just panicky and he's just hot and sweaty. He does not have corona. He was checked like you know throughout this entire trip. Can you let him go outside and try to like uh, take all the stuff off and come back in? So I go outside, and I'm telling you, Graham, at that point I was having like a panic attack. 
started thinking, maybe I do have the coronavirus. Maybe I'm not going to be able to get out of China. And I started to just sweat more. And I just feel like I could not calm down. And like it was just seeping down my head. And it's weird when you're trying to calm yourself down in a situation like that. And it's just making it worse. But luckily, I made it through. But I'll admit that was a little scary because what I was told is if I had not been able to get through and my temperature had still beeped, I would have had to go to a medical center and I would have been put into a database and then I would have had to fight the fever for two weeks. I mean, it was just be the very whole thing. It would be months maybe before I could actually return. So I'm happy to be here with you and I'm happy that did not happen. But that well, was my experience. You know, I, I, I just want to, before we go, um, you know, I just want to repeat the thing you said to me over the phone. Um, actually, you're one of the people I called when Ron and I were debating to go to, to Florida or not. I'm so glad we didn't go because they closed the beaches and we could have been stuck in Florida. And one of the things you said, you go, while you really wanted to get home from China, you were more worried, not about getting sick, but about being uh, the American, you were more for afraid of the American government and the American people freaking out because you were just in China where people weren't like, you saw some of it, but people weren't just like, Whoa, you know, wigging out. They, and the thing they wigged out on were like the good, the smart thing, like, hey, put your mask back on, not just selfish, shove you out of the way thing. Um, and that's the thing I was feeling, I'm worried like this, this country is acting like some kind of banana republic that doesn't, like the doctors and scientists have been talking about a pandemic for at least 20 to 30 years and we don't have one in place. We should, have a, we should have a plan in place that just goes like that. We're ready to go. There's military mobile hospitals just ready to be deployed in case the, the spy, like all this should be ready. We should have free healthcare, Medicare for all across the board. We should have plans in place. The Fed can give the, the banks trillions of dollars in, the, in a heartbeat. That money should just be like, here's $2 trillion, boom. Every American's gonna get, you know, 1,500, two grand a month for the next two months or whatever the thing is, just do it. Um, and I so, want to see action. Yeah, I want to see action quickly. I want to see action quickly. This is turning into like a hob sort of like state of nature, like everybody's freaking. I mean, that is what is going to be the, the damage to, to society itself. It'll destroy itself. I mean, I hate to, to be a pessimist, but unless we start to take a more well-measured approach to all things in life, and I'm not talking about like the progressives, but about everyday people, whether it's foreign policy, whether it's health, like uh, start taking a more measured approach to thinking about not just yourself, but the countries around you. It was amazing to me that people in the U.S. were not really worried about people in China because I worry about people in Palestine and it doesn't it doesn't necessarily affect me directly. But once you start thinking about human beings as human beings and without the sort of uh, like football teams and like by invisible borders, and it's like us against them against them. I know it sounds utopian. And even people in China were saying to me when I was saying it to them that it sounded utopian. That is really the truth of it is we are all human beings. We have different cultures and beliefs, but we should care about all human beings because what happens here, we're especially seeing now, affects people here, affects people here. And we're all, you know what I mean? It, it's amazing to me how people still get stuck in this mindset of like, you know, we got to take care of our own. And in reality, we're all connected. And, and if we were all to think about things in that kind of way, especially with something like this, this might have been preventable. It, it, there wasn't as much pointing and saying, oh, you know, it kind of sucks to be you. Let's close off from China. Um and more of an immediate like, okay, well, that could come here and maybe we should be collaborating with China. I mean, there was a little bit of that, but it just wasn't It just wasn't what it should have been. And I hope this sends a message to America, this sort of isolationist, oh. uh, the, the, you know, the, the, like we're not, isol we're not isolationist when we're like pirating other countries and destroying them, but we are when it comes to like any other kind of thing, like helping others and things like that. That I was mean, the, the tone that I noticed change in the last two days of press conferences from Trump and his administration is like, Oh, because all these doctors and scientists are going, you need to talk to the people in China. You need to talk to doctors in Iran. You need to talk to a doctors in Italy. You need to get, we need data. Doctors and scientists are screaming for data so they can find some kind of thing. And that's that we have to, I hope everyone wakes up to this thing. I hope Trump supporters, I hope these dipshit fucking Biden supporter, idiot neoliberals who are worse than Trump supporters, they're the dumbest. They think they're so they smart because they have the college degree and a rainbow flag, but they are the worst, worst people. They don't, they don't, un, they don't, they got, they got their micro brew and they think they're all LGBTQ, but they don't give a shit about anybody else. And they think they're better and they're not. They're oh, actually worse. They do. I was just called, uh, called by several of them, a white privileged male that's not allowed to have an opinion because I don't want to vote Biden. Let's not forget, I mean, you and, my, you and myself, we're, we're more in tune with a lot of these progressive groups and some of the most sort of vulnerable communities because we know a lot of activists. I know people in North Carolina fighting neo-Nazis and 
the people we know people here, Latin activists with people knowing people in cages, like actually knowing them, not watching mm -hmm. it on MSNBC. And none of them are voting for Biden. So the sort of privileged male, white affluent perspective from people who don't actually know these kind of people. And they point to like, well, moderate, moderate, uh, moderate black people in uh, South Carolina voted for Biden. What are they, the establishment? No, no, those aren't the establishment. But when pharma bro Jim Clyburn uh, is going around lying to their faces or you have the Obama legacy or it, this is the thing, too. I know we have to go with why is it so hard to believe for some people like the MSNBC crowd believes that Russian Facebook ads is why progressives didn't vote for Clinton, that we are not smart enough to make our own choices. And that was a million dollars in Facebook ads. What about the like 200 million to 500 million people like Bloomberg and Super PACs and health, you know, health insurance companies right. were pumping on the airwaves all day, every day in places like South Carolina, where they are uneducated. So it, it, a million in Facebook ads could could take a lot of progressives by storm. But in lesser, lesser educated, less knowledgeable areas uh, like working class people who, you know, believe in the Biden stuff being force fed this stuff on the air all the time, they could not be, you know, that didn't influence them. They, they're just diehard Biden supporters. I mean, it just it, it's always falls like I think Jimmy said it's always against us when anytime anything falls any certain way, um, you know, like it's always the not it's always against the progressives. Whenever there's a mix up in the votes or the exit polls, it's always for the establishment, you know, like we never get any. We're always the enemy, you know, and I think uh, I, I can't stand the Biden voters anymore. The vote blue, no matter who they they are, they sound like a bunch of people with Stockholm syndrome, like they have a gun to their head. They just have and they've they start to enjoy voting against their own self-interest they, because well, you know it's what? always a difference. They weren't bombed in the Middle East. They weren't the, one of the six million people who lost their homes. They weren't one of the three million people deported by Obama and Biden. They they weren't they weren't they don't have undrinkable water in Flint, Michigan. They don't care. It didn't affect them, so they don't care. Just like the Republicans, like literally, I had a guy that's a big Biden supporter tell me as my he goes, I paid my mortgage, Graham. How come you lost your home? Literally. He was publicly shipped for losing my home. And I was like, uh, I lost work because of the recession, the banks. And he was like, oh, uh -huh. like that's literally. Horrifying. That's horrifying. That's horrifying. He's a guy who lives, you know, and his, his profile was like, oh, I'm in San Francisco. And just unbelievable. And he said he was a firefighter. And I was like, is that what you do when you go to someone? Oh, your house burnt down. I got smoke detectors in my house. <laughs> Sorry. Is that what you, you know, It's in San Francisco of all places where the homeless problem yes. is like, Unbelievable. I mean, he's either been completely like many Americans, and that's another thing I saw too. The cynicism in America is sick sometimes. In China, you don't see that. It's like me, oh, who can make the best meme about Corona, and let's make a lot of jokes about it. And there's just a, is, we've become so desensitized to homelessness, to addiction, yeah. to murder. I mean, it's just gotten to a point where it, it it's Another scary. neoliberal asshole made fun of me for having PTSD about going to, I was mentioning going to war zones. Oh, you complained, whined about your PTSD. This is what this guy is. And I'm sure he's like, oh, these Trump supporters are so awful on the internet. Like, uh, this, is, this is the neoliberal left. Tell me, tell me how they're worse than the Confederate flag waving guy that says Trump never lies. Oh my gosh. I've seen some neoliberal posts from like Buttigieg, you know, we're the toxic supporters. I've seen some horrifying, like, like horrifying stuff. About horrifying. Nina Turner, stuff about Brandon Greyjoy. I mean, anyway, like, I don't want to yeah, keep yeah, talking that, about that's these other, fucking that's assholes. So if you but, voted for Biden, you voted for Trump and you're stupid. Um, so remember that you're a fucking idiot. Just no look in the mirror every day and say, I voted for Biden. I'm fucking stupid. Um, and, uh, Kevin, thank you so much for the work you're doing. Where can people find you? I know you got another movie coming out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I could do the sort of shameless promotion that everybody does at the end of these kind of things, uh, just, uh, I want to make sure everybody can find our stuff. So if you go to YouTube, uh, right brain studios, you can find our documentary about, uh, Bernie's revolution and the DNC and everything. Um, so that's W R I T E brain studios. Uh, and also, we have a new documentary, and I'm just going to say this briefly. Uh, it's about addiction and homelessness, and Amazon has blocked its release, even though it's won awards. You know, just another roadblock our, our collective faced. Um, you know, this film won awards. It played at the same festivals as Earl Morris's work, but uh, Amazon arbitrarily said it was offensive. So, you know, half a million people sleeping on the street and millions affected by the opioid crisis. And a lot of addicts and healthcare professionals have gotten behind this film. Um, it's a slap in the face to those communities. If you are stuck at home right now and social distancing, 
Go to Vimeo On Demand and watch Nightcrawlers. Uh, support us and give a big middle finger to Amazon because uh, that's the only way we're going to change anything is to get people to support the film and prove to them that the film actually has a broad appeal. Even though it's very real, it's an issue that affects so many people, and that's why its appeal should be broad. So, uh, yes, yeah, so if you, if you want to follow that on Instagram, too, uh, Nightcrawlers Movie, uh, look it up. You can find all the info about that film out. Uh, thank you so much for having me there. You got it. Jeff Bezos could literally end homelessness overnight, and he blocked your movie. So. Absolutely. He personally <laughs> did it, too. He was there, and he was like, nope, yeah. not going to happen. He's, so. a, he's a jackass. He's the part of the ruling class. So uh, go check out Kevin's work. Watch the movie Nightcrawlers. Uh, thank you for supporting the show, everybody. Like, share, subscribe. Even if you've hit the subscribe and bell notification buttons uh, before, do it again. Uh, I go live uh, every Sunday, but I'm even going to start to go more live during the week. Um, because I'm, I can't go on the road. I can't tell jokes. So I'm going to be doing more, uh, live stuff here. Uh, and I'm also support the show. I cannot do the show without your support. I do not get money from Raytheon or Coca-Cola or Shell Oil or anybody like that. I only get to do the show because of you, the viewers. Make the show happen. Go to patreon.com slash Graham Elwood or rockfin.com slash Graham Elwood, which is a blockchain cryptocurrency platform. Kevin, thank you so much for watching and thank you all of uh, everyone out there for making Got Them Great Again. Like, share, and subscribe. Hit the bell notification button and the subscribe button, even if you've done it before because they're unsubscribing many of you every day. Watch the ads all the way through. If you click skip ad, I don't get paid. Also, support us at patreon.com slash Graham Elwood or rockfin.com slash Graham Elwood. Rockfin.com is a blockchain cryptocurrency platform. All my videos are on Rockfin ad free. Thanks for watching. <laughs>